First of all, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners and custodians of this land in which we gather here tonight, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Australia is and will always be Aboriginal land and I just want to acknowledge that all of the writing that I share with you tonight has been written on the stolen land. And I'd also like to dedicate this to my father, who's no longer with us. He's just been the biggest news to me in Melbourne, so this is to him as well. Um, so I'll start with my first poem that was written in 2012, and um, it's actually part of a play that I've written called Make Me a Huri, which I'm really excited about staging in August at La Mama. Finally. <laughs> I'll be performing in it, as well as my lovely, beautiful, talented friend, Nisha Joseph, over there. Um, so I'm super excited about that, and if you're interested in this sort of reading, it's definitely up your alley then. Um, so this is, well, for this reading, I'm going to call this little bit of the excerpt, A Blue Dress Sweats Wine Down Sydney Road. Sister, cash or credit, when's the last time you prayed? On pay pass, do you read the Quran? Sorry, it's been declined. What are the five pillars of Islam? Can you use another card? Are you a Muslim Muslim? Check your savings. Is that perfume I smell? Savings, please. I have tears in my eyes, sister. Savings, please. I don't cry for you, I cry for your parents. Savings, please. Do you believe in the end times? Savings, please. Sister, save yourself. Savings, please. Save yourself. Savings, please. Would you like a copy of that transaction? No. <laughs> Conversations um, in cars with drivers now have shifted quite a bit from the likes of sister I'm concerned for your soul to I'm so sorry that you've stopped liking Nutella <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm just noticing right now that I really do truly feel that there are more and more energies of love um, and they're dissolving these energies of fear around me here and last winter I made the switch from living from a fear-based reality to a love-based one. And I actually wrote it as a diary entry. I made, I set this intention consciously and I flipped into this mindset on the 9th of August, 2018. It's, it's worked wonders, trust me. Um, <laughs> I even told a stranger at the time, no matter what the cynics think, I just want to move through a world with more art, poetry, magic and beauty. I just, yeah, really felt like bulging with honesty at that time, and I just spoke my mind and my truth, and it was really nice. Um, but I wasn't feeling this way early on in the year, last year in 2018. Around this time, I was working quite intensely through cleansing my karma with a shamanic healer. And one ritual she made me do was write a list of all of my previous karmic soulmates, or anyone I had a romantic affiliation to, and then one by one, I had to blow them all out into one of my moonstones. And she said that this would release me from any remaining residues that I may have carried from these relationships. So I did it. <laughs> and a week after that, suddenly I find myself at the Melbourne Theatre Company in rehearsals for a play called Hungry Ghosts. <laughs> now in Chinese and um, Buddhist mythology, hungry ghosts normally are referred to as hungry, restless demons in limbo. Um, and in post-traumatic theatre fashion, a bit of my function as an actor on stage was to play the projection of the protagonist's ego. So as you can imagine, it didn't really go hand in hand with all the soul purification work I was doing, but a job's a job. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is just an expression of that experience. I call it disembodied. I blew out all of my 25 lovers into a moonstone to end my karmic wheel. A week before I breathed in a hungry ghost. I held my heart's light hostage and left it in a black box for a fortnight and a few days and a couple of private girls' school matinees. In the rehearsal space, I coughed out my purity and inhaled the grease from spirits of air and fire. 
fumes of mythical sylphs and gins transpired into what would become the pause of a post-dramatic performance. My body oiled itself into renditions of revenge and rage, but my soul constantly excused herself to go meditate backstage. <laughs> a metaphoric motor burns out from finessed figures of speech that screeched of sound cues my spirit could no longer follow. But we crafted a clever, cyclical, cerebral haunt of tragedy, loss, and corrupt power. A little black breath of comedy running over a little an hour. Does writing carry a conscience? I blew out all of my 25 lovers into a moonstone to end my karmic wheel. My moonstone wasn't as grubby as the decay and gangrene from waters of wordplay. Morality moved over for muscle memory as we synchronized stylized movements of airplane passenger corpses crashing into a young playwright's poetry. Does writing carry a conscience? I couldn't quite anchor myself after that. And I literally got ghosted by a guy soon after. Like he just disappeared, didn't say a word, but I really do thank him for his disappearing act. <laughs> and immediately after closing that show, I flew back to Malaysia to do a poetry performance art piece, which revolved around the death of my father and that experience of grieving and, and yeah, the loss I felt at the time. So this is an excerpt from that poetry performance I called Starlight. A soul is just a hole of color hovering above the ground. When I hear that word soul, that's what I see, just a hole of color. And when you died, I felt suffocated by space, like I had fallen for some sick trick between time and stars, like some kind of thick purple vapor smothered me, like I was being nailed down by a galaxy. You were always a stardust boy to me a religious Sufi leader fueled by your desire to follow a sharp line straight back up to the divine. A diamond struck your secret heart and you fell head over heels in love. Your 3D prison body tumbled into all the shapes that came with this fascination with your newfound fragmentation. As you expanded into dimensions I couldn't reach and met with angels and angles I couldn't measure. You loved your shapes, didn't you? Mm -hmm probably why you have stars. They had points, a pattern of principles I resisted to work out. And you wanted to be in sequence, in accordance, in alignment, like a perfectly inelastic price elasticity diagram in my economics textbook, never to scale. I couldn't compete with your fractal fairy tale. We will speak now amongst bowls of flowers. I drop my crumpled mind into the crinkles of orchids. My fragrant pain finds itself splashing across you from the blush of rose water. Fresh and trembling, every petal, your petrified daughter collapsing into her growth. Stay with me. You smile at me through tattered jasmine, amongst rain and restless ants. I can't translate your voice and have no choice but to hear you now through songs of violet stars, rhythms of street lights and scars, as I cling onto the strums of Carlos Santana to paint your shards of soul and the synth of Pink Floyd to find your form. What have you become? Are you listening through these flowers? Your grave fizzed onto my fingers as I felt your light reach up towards my palm, as if, as if you were jumping up from the other side. Light splutters across the universe from your dimensions into mine in the shape of some beautiful delusion. I used to see you in suits. Now I feel you in streams. was clearly a stardust boy <laughs> and when he left he left me down here with a different strain of stardust men 
and there's a huge concentration of them, particularly in the suburbs of inner Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my little ode to them. And I call this, I want to be with you so badly, although you seem to want oblivion. An espresso martini teeters around her telephone as she waits for the call after his shift at Club X. She's an op shop calf for his 4 a.m. playpen in her cow print pajamas and baby Kahlua eyes. He was a balding burgundy jacket. His voice, a cracked share house ceiling. He was a six foot something stumbling cigarette spewing Carl Young and Carl Sagan vignettes. As a defense mechanism against my spirituality, he dropped acid and atheism. <laughs> But he's got a throat chakra symbol in his bedroom, and he really likes Rumi. <laughs> he's a secret who won't stop rolling and won't start listening. I'm dressed in Y's, and he's dressed in what's, and our mouths are too tight to find more consonants. I punch and press symbols on his pierced pecs to find his function, because something's just not adding up in this equation. I just kept losing. I just kept losing to the boys who love looking up to the boys in love with shattering themselves and calling it beautiful. I wanted to appreciate them at more than just a subatomic level, but they kept getting off at the thought of being a speck in an ever-expanding universe, and well, to them, I was just today's glitter. <laughs> but he really likes Rumi. <laughs> As a daughter of a late stardust boy, an ascended master of divine stardusting, I'm developing some cosmic girl peer planetary pressure mostly from female social media accounts with an Instagram spiritual sector. <laughs> Stardust boys, I'm so sorry that I don't share photos of my cervix encoded in sacred geometry. <laughs> that when I spread my legs apart, there's no downpour of a galaxy. That my ego can't undress for you. That my ego can't even seem to undress for me. That I'm still confused by the concept of connection and unity but you really like Rumi. <laughs> I vow to the star of Sirius, no more earthy clutter. I promise to be as silent as an astral mutter as I dissolve into Bill Hicks's famous slow wave of vibration. I'll be just a drop in your ocean. Or was it the entire ocean in one drop? I'll be a pure, cosmic continuum of ultimate consciousness for you. Since you love searching for universal truths, I've got to be honest with you now. I didn't know what continuum meant, so I looked it up. Uninter uninterrupted existence. Now, is that not just another definition for loneliness? Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how much more uplifted and uprooted after this phase of introspection and all these performances. And I needed to get back on the ground. I just needed to kiss the earth again in some way. I realized that I am done with breathtaking romances. <laughs> but now what I wanted is essential, sustainable, soul-supporting, oxygenated love. <laughs> I call this one Equatorial Baby Misses Her Warmth. I trust you the way slow honey slopes out of a wild hive. My soul rose blooms into mixed tropes as my vines ferment on the floor. Our touch is as raw as foliage in rain as the barks of our lungs graze with every coarse vein. Drugged by the breath of a forest, we are stuttering sap, surrendering to gurgles of amber as we unfurl our senses in the humid pearl. I choose to awaken in the interstice of this world. Let me be a nymph in your lymph, as, and rather than my paws be pummeled by physics, will lie back and bask into the baselines of your biology. You've activated ecological systems inside of me. <laughs> Your seeds seep of energetic dreaming. So I'll try not to trample all over your bioluminescence tonight, but I won't ever stop the stems of my spirit from leaning into the luscious suctions of your air and light. 
So once I finally learnt my lesson that these Stardust boys just couldn't hold me up, or hold me, around early August last year, I finally let go of them, and I started to learn ways to hold myself a little tighter, and trust this energy inside of me. And on this self-discovery, rediscovery, I came across Elon Musk's top tips for productivity. <laughs> and the only tip I seem to remember is focus on signal over noise. And I know he was referring to marketing strategies, <laughs> but I really tried to apply them to my own spiritual practice. <laughs> and around the same period, I just started seeing these suspicious number patterns everywhere I went, and I'd walk past 222s and 333s, 555s, 88s. And I chose to view these numbers as codes, as signals from the universe. And so I threw myself back into the realm of numerology. And I sought out the meaning behind some of these sequences. And where better to start attuning to these numbers than on the grid of Melbourne CBD? For instance, if you came across 101 on your path, it suggests that your guardian angels are telling you to listen to your heart and follow your emotions. That harmony and positivity is just around the corner, but you might have to surrender and just let the universe take over. Love is dissolving fear. Love is dissolving fear when the immigration officer at Tullamarine now stops me at the baggage inspection area because my lapis lazuli caught his eye in my carry-on and he was just being nosy. <laughs> when the man who works for ANZ Bank, who I serve burritos almost every day, asked if I've ever been to Crystal Castle before. When a fairy at the airport speaks a foreign tongue to me and leaves in my hand a card with the number 33 and a sketch of a key on it after she saw me cry before boarding. A new consciousness is seeping through and you never know who might just drive up to you. Worlds are no longer colliding. They seem to coalesce in response to a long-awaited newborn compassion. Paradise on earth starts with a change in perception. And this will be my last poem for tonight. It's a slightly altered version of a poem I wrote for an online crystal shops blog that just never got posted. <laughs> but I really like it. <laughs> um, and I call it, move the way you want and find opportunities around you. The space between 101 Collins and a beer garden on Flinders Lane may have brewed the reunion between a pair of twin flames. You told me you played keys and used DJ decks to operate portals of energy. I expressed, I've just made the choice to surrender and live in a love-based reality. I want to see our world through more art, beauty, magic, and poetry. I confess to you, I only made the switch last Thursday, actually. <laughs> After an hour, we shifted from your SUV to a cocktail bar's booth. In the lounge of an electric lady, we grounded ourselves in seats of truth. Tonight, we focused on the signal and not the noise, as we said goodbye to the tunes of rabbit hole girls and stardust boys. How could we write a ride that was dissolving into destiny as we disclosed our passion for crystals, nature, and conscious intimacy? There was a calling for me to share with you my special seraphonite. It was met with the sight of your hand clutching onto a piece of hematite. I smiled and tried to fish around for more hidden gems in my back pocket, while you grinned and pulled out from underneath your t-shirt your favorite amethyst locket. With a semi-precious stone in our palms, our guts spiraled in surprise, as synchronicity steamed up our cores and charged a new light in our eyes. Serendipity's August day in the city made it quite clear for us to see that we were always two bodies requesting to flow into the waves of one frequency. How could we rate a ride that was dissolving into destiny? Five stars to Melbourne's unpredictable late night PTV. Five stars to my babe Anna Kennedy for saying you to you lady. Five stars to you for pressing yes to having a 14 minute chat with me. Uber and the universe have one thing in common. If you're open to trusting their services, I guarantee they both will deliver. <laughs> Thank you again, everyone, for listening. Oh. Give me a
and we were right next to you all the way. Um, I, I feel really quite overcome. Let's just have another big round of applause. Yeah, I'd love to see your play in August. Yes. yes. <laughs>